Um, I just want to welcome you all to the Darien Library author talk. I want to thank you for joining us. I especially want to thank our friends of the library who support these programs and make them possible. I also want to thank our partners at Barrett Books who have Kate's books on the shelf and ready for your uh, purchasing tomorrow. And uh, let me think what, who else we have. To, oh, we have to tell you about questions and answers. We um, will take Q&A afterwards and just put it in the Q&A section. And tonight you are lucky to hear Kate Moore, the woman they could not silence, speak about her book. Kate is a New York Times, USA Today, the Wall Street Journal, best-selling author for her book, Radium Girls, which was fascinating. So read this one and then read that one. They're both parts of history that you probably know a little bit about, but they're really fascinating. She has a background in, public, in the book publishing world, and in her first year launching her career as an author, she wrote 11 books. So what have we been doing? That's amazing. And she's also a ghostwriter, and she's written quite a few titles for children. Kate is London, located in London, and she's staying up to almost midnight tonight to be with us. And she has a she's always on the list of the Sunday Times bestsellers. So with her, for her latest book, The Woman They Could Not Silence, let me see, I don't have the book because they're all out at the library. That's You've a good thought. <laughs> and um, the reviews have been outstanding. So let us welcome Kate and sit down, get comfortable, and let's enjoy this program. We'll see you in a little bit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining uh, us this evening. And thank you to the library too for inviting me to come along and talk to you about my new book. Here it is. I have a copy. Uh, the Woman They Could Not Silence. Uh, it's been an absolute privilege to write this book. And it is my honour to introduce you to Elizabeth Packard, who is The Woman They Could Not Silence. She is perhaps the most inspiring and resilient woman I have ever encountered. And I'm really excited to talk to you tonight about her. I'm going to start the presentation shortly by doing uh, an edited extract uh, reading from the book, partly because I'd like you to get a glimpse into how I've chosen to help Elizabeth tell her story. Uh, I am a nonfiction writer. This is a history book but I hope that the extract will give you a glimpse into the rather novelistic way that I write. Everything in the, back, in the book is true, everything is factual, every line of dialogue comes from a trial transcript or a letter or a diary, a record made by someone who was present at the time. But I've entwined those sources into a narrative so that I hope you will walk in step with Elizabeth, that she will become a friend to you as you read. And so I want to start with that reading very shortly. But first, let me set the scene. Our story starts on the cusp of the American Civil War in June 1860. And it starts with Elizabeth Packard, who was just five foot one inch tall, with dark hair and brown eyes, lying in bed in her marital home. She's 43 years old and she is a housewife and mother of six. And the story starts with a very simple question. What would happen if your husband could commit you to an insane asylum just because you disagreed with him? And at this point, let's turn to that reading I promised you. It comes from chapter one of The Woman They Could Not Silence. The setting is June 18th, 1860, and the town is Mantino, Illinois. It was the last day, but she didn't know it. In truth, we never do, not until it is too late. She woke in a handsome maple bed, body covered by a snow white counterpane. As her senses resurfaced after a restless night's sleep, Elizabeth Packard's brown eyes blearily mapped the landmarks of her room, embroidered ottoman, mahogany bureau, and smart green shutters that, for some reason, were failing to let in any light. Ordinarily, her husband of 21 years, Theophilus, a preacher, would have been snoring next to her, his gravity-defying curly red hair an impromptu pillow beneath his head. 
but a few long weeks before he'd abandoned their marital bed. He thought it best, or so he'd said, to sleep alone these days. Instead, her senses were filled by the precious proximity of her slumbering six-year-old son. Her children were truly the sun, moon and stars to Elizabeth. To see their happy faces and laughing eyes offered such blessed light. It was particularly welcome in a world that was becoming, by the day, increasingly black. Such melancholy thoughts were uncharacteristic for Elizabeth. In normal times, the 43-year-old was always rejoicing, but the splits that were even now threatening her country, with some forecasting an all-out civil war, were mirrored in her small domestic sphere within her neat two-story home. Over the past four months, she and her husband had retreated behind those enemy lines, prompting much anxious foreboding from Elizabeth. The Packards had married in 1839, when Elizabeth was a green 22 and Theophilus a dusty 37. At first, all had seemed well. Elizabeth had been raised to be a silent listener, and her preacher husband contentedly became the sole mouthpiece in their marriage. To make him happy was the height of my ambition, Elizabeth wrote. That's all I wanted, to make my husband shine inside and out. The problem in their marriage had been, he didn't make her shine in return. Their characters were as opposite as it was possible to get. Where Elizabeth was vibrant, sociable and curious, Theophilus was gloomy, timorous and, in his own words, dull. Elizabeth described their marriage as cheerless. Nevertheless, she said nothing to him directly. That is, until everything changed. In 1848, the first Women's Rights Convention was held in Seneca Falls, New York, unleashing a national conversation about the rights of women. It was one in which Elizabeth and, less willingly, Theophilus took part. Countless times, the couple had warm discussions on the subject. It was Elizabeth, naturally blessed with a most rare command of language, who triumphed in these fights. Yet her victories came at a cost. She felt the demonstration of her intellect prompted jealousy, lest I outshine him. Theophilus was stung to the quick, and his grievances slowly grew. He was the kind of man who counted them like pennies, recording slights in his diary with the miserly accuracy of a rich man unwilling to share his wealth. He grumbled crossly, my wife was unfavourably affected by the tone of society and zealously espoused almost all new notions and wild vagaries that came along. Perhaps the notion that caused him most consternation? In Elizabeth's words, I, though a woman, have just as good a right to my opinion as my husband has to his. Elizabeth's newfound autonomy was anathema to Theophilus. Wives obey your husbands became a scriptural passage oft quoted in their home. But Elizabeth was no longer silently listening. Defiantly, she kept on articulating her own thoughts, asserting her own self inspired by the women's rights movement that it was her right to do so. Theophilus's response was telling. He did not allow his wife agency. He did not encourage her independence. Instead, he wrote that he had sad reason to fear his wife's mind was getting out of order. She was becoming insane on the subject of women's rights. On the morning of June 18th, 1860, Elizabeth shifted uncomfortably in bed, her disquiet slowly intensifying. 
Over the past four months, Theophilus had made it plain he wanted her gone. He could not cope with his newly outspoken wife, with her independent mind and her independent spirit, not least because Elizabeth did not keep her new character confined to their home. She asserted herself in public too. In the face of her impassioned eloquence, Theophilus felt powerless and furiously impotent. He conceived a plan. He kept it simple. Just seven words intended to silence her once and for all. When the Packards next argued, he warned Elizabeth, if she did not conform, I shall put you into the asylum. Now, you might have thought, as Elizabeth Packard did, well, what a ridiculous thing to say. Of course, he can't send her away to an insane asylum just because she disagreed with him. Of course, he can't dispatch her to a mental hospital just because she's an assertive woman. But there you, like Elizabeth, would be wrong. Because as crazy as it seems to us today, in Elizabeth's time, women were regularly committed for acts of self-assertion. And so, as Theophilus began to ruminate on his plan and to tell his fellow parishioners about it, Elizabeth found that actually they took his side. They began to weigh her behaviour and found her wanting. When they saw Elizabeth becoming angry with him because he had not cleaned the yard, well, this sight of an angry woman was seen as unnatural and sick. She seemed insane to them. Similarly, when Elizabeth voiced dislike for her husband, this man to whom she had promised herself forever, well, that too seemed a form of madness. And then there was the final nail in her coffin. The parishioners cited her incessant talking as evidence of madness. In the end, Elizabeth decided to leave her husband's church. She went to worship with the Methodists instead. And this too was cited as evidence of madness. She would not leave the church unless she was insane, said one. To Elizabeth's shock, however, it wasn't just these small town parishioners who thought she was mad. In fact, the received medical wisdom of the age said that assertive women were indeed textbook examples of female insanity. Women who had ungovernable personalities or who possessed plenty of what is termed nerve were deemed actually to be completely insane. Those quotes that I was doing there are actually quotations from doctors of the era. There was something known as moral insanity, and it was defined simply as eccentricity of conduct. But eccentricity of conduct, like beauty, is simply in the eye of the beholder. And in the terms of the 19th century, any woman who was assertive or ambitious was deemed to be acting in an eccentric way and was therefore deemed to be morally insane. The idea ran that a woman was supposed to be satisfied simply to be a wife and a mother, and any woman who pushed those boundaries was deemed insane. And there were actually another strike against Elizabeth too, because not only was she assertive, she was educated. She was actually a quite brilliant woman. She had received a very good education uh, as a young girl and actually went on to have a teaching career before her marriage. At the age of 19, she was a principal at Randolph College in Massachusetts and indeed had a very, very impressive career at such a young age. But in the terms of the 19th century, an educated woman was not a brilliant woman, but a woman who was dallying on the precipice of madness. In 1858, a doctor who went to visit a local girls' high school remarked to its teachers that they were training their girls for the lunatic asylum. Similarly, 
in May 1860, just a month before Elizabeth is waking up in bed with that sense of foreboding in her stomach, a young woman aged 15 and known only as B was committed to an asylum. Her symptoms of madness was that she had become greatly addicted to novel reading. In fact, novel reading was seen as one of the leading causes of insanity in that era. When I was researching my book and looked up the records of the Illinois State Hospital, the hospital to which Theophilus Packard applied when he wanted to send his wife away, I looked up their records and I found listed in them lines detailing the causes of insanity. Foremost among them was novel reading. To explain the theory behind this idea that an educated woman was a potential mad woman, we can turn to Dr. Andrew McFarland, the superintendent of the Illinois State Hospital, the man who held Elizabeth Packard's fate in his hands. He opined that when minds of limited capacity to comprehend subjects tried to do so, it ultimately led to mental breakdown. And this, he believed, was what had happened to assertive Elizabeth Packard. And so, in June 1860, Elizabeth found herself kidnapped, as she called it, by her husband and taken to the Illinois State Hospital. On a hot summer's night, she climbed the stone steps of the asylum and found that the door slammed shut behind her. McFarland admitted her as a case of slight insanity, committed for excessive application of body and mind. Or as Elizabeth put it, she'd been placed there by her husband for thinking. At first, Elizabeth was not too concerned Okay, the medicine of the age was against her, but no matter, she would turn to the law for remedy and for release. But here Elizabeth had another shock, because the law too was set against her. There was a law known as coverture, which was in operation in America at that time. It was a law first written in the 1100s and it had been inherited from England. It seems we Brits have a lot to answer for. Coverture can be expressed and defined simply by saying this. The husband and the wife, in the eyes of the law, are one. And that one is the husband. It meant married women had no legal civic identity at all. They were literally shadows of their spouses when it came to their civic identities. It meant women had no right to custody of their children, no right to property, no right to their own earnings, and crucially, in Elizabeth Packard's case, no right to their very liberty. By law in Illinois, a husband could send his wife to an asylum by request, and specifically without the evidence of insanity that was required in other cases. But because the wife was seen almost as her husband's property, he could do with her as he wished. And this loss of autonomy for women is not just a distant historical example. In fact, echoes from that law of coverture stretched right into the 20th century. Did you know, for example, that it wasn't until 1974 that women could get credit cards independently? Before then, a man had to co-sign any credit application that a woman made. And in fact, the banks would usually discount her earnings by as much as 50%. In Switzerland, meanwhile, it wasn't until 1985 that a married woman could work or even open a bank account without her husband's permission. This was the world in which Elizabeth Packard operated too a world in which her husband could dispatch her to an asylum and there was no legal remedy for her release. She very quickly realised that the odds were stacked against her and she realised that the very next morning when she arose on 7th Ward in the hospital. She walked down the long corridors and entered into the breakfast room and there she was faced with hundreds of other women 
who had experienced the same thing she had. These women had also been dispatched to the asylums by their husbands, by their fathers, by their brothers. These were women who had caused the greatest domestic trouble to their families, women who would not be corralled or controlled. And so they had been sent away to teach them better manners. The wards were overcrowded. And in fact, the year after Elizabeth arrived at the asylum, a new ward would open, a whole new wing built on the hospital with space to commit another 150 patients every single one of them would be a woman. And this insight, this fact, gives us a glimpse into another reality of the 19th century in which Elizabeth Packard was operating. And that was that you didn't just have to be an assertive woman or an educated woman to be deemed mad. In fact, being a woman full stop was seen as a predicament that could lead you to becoming insane. Simply possessing a female body left you at increased risk of madness, according to the doctors of the time. The idea ran that something called a uterine derangement could strike a woman at any time. Her menstrual cycle was seen as something incredibly dangerous to her mental balance, so much so that doctors actually encouraged mothers to try to delay the onset of their daughter's periods. The advice given was that these teenage girls should avoid feather beds, those ever pernicious novels, and they should uh, also not wear drawers. This was the advice given to try to stop these young women from running mad indeed. And so Elizabeth found everything was stacked against her. But how Elizabeth responded to this predicament is why I've chosen to write a book about her, because she responded in a quite remarkable way. It was made very clear to the women of Seventh Ward that there was an easy way out and an easy way home. All they had to do was submit to learn to become those obedient wives and obedient daughters that society expected of them. Elizabeth called it woman crushing machinery. Yet in Elizabeth's case, actually, she wrote that the woman crushing machinery in her case works the wrong way. The true woman shines brighter and brighter under the process instead of being strangled. And this is perhaps one of my favorite aspects of Elizabeth Packard's story. The book is called The Woman They Could Not Silence. But what it's really about is Elizabeth's journey to become the woman they could not silence, her journey to find that unsilenceable voice. She begins the book as a housewife, a woman who writes that when she was asked to contribute to a Bible class lesson, she said, I felt so small somehow as though nothing I said was hardly worth saying or hearing. And yet by the book's end, this is a woman who stands up for what she believes in. She stands up and she speaks out on a national level, on an international level. She's quite extraordinary. And I love that this book charts her journey, the journey to believe in herself, the journey to find that strength and that confidence within her. And actually the crucible of suffering, this same woman being sent away to an insane asylum is what makes it happen. And so as Elizabeth is forced to live in this asylum, surrounded by mad women and not so mad women as well, sent away from her children, from her home, from her position in society, she writes, she writes and writes and writes. And that is the key to her finding her voice. And Elizabeth writes, the worst that my enemies can do, they have done. And I fear them no more. I am now free to be true and honest. No opposition can overcome me. And so even though Elizabeth is denied a voice and is denied agency, she finds it for herself. She begins to keep a secret journal. She squirrels away scraps of newspapers and magazines. She steals scraps of fabric and she records her thoughts. She records the abuse that she is witnessing and so in this way, Elizabeth sees herself take shape on the page. 
And she uses that voice in the end, not only to save herself, but also to save her sisters. She becomes a pioneer, a champion, not only for herself, not only for the women in the asylum, but for women all across the world. A truly extraordinary and special person. And it's no spoiler to say that in this book, she moves from housewife to historically significant heroine, someone who successfully manages to improve the rights of women and the mentally ill. But make no mistake, though this is a history book, the issues at its heart could not be more modern. And actually, this is how I came to the story. The story didn't start for me in June 1860 on the cusp of the American Civil War. It started in the fall of 2017, amid the fire of the Me Too movement. Everywhere that fall, as you may remember, women were speaking up and speaking out against sexism, against harassment, against misogyny, against rape. And finally, we were being listened to. And that's what really struck me about that movement, because actually women have always spoken up against these things, but usually we've been dismissed. And I got to thinking, well, how have we been dismissed in the past? Why is it over only now that we're being listened to and believed? And I thought, actually, for centuries, whenever women have used our voices, we've been called crazy. That's how we've been kept in our box, that's how we've been undermined and controlled and belittled with this accusation of insanity. Our actions viewed through this prism of mental health or mental illness. And that was something I wanted to write about because it's still happening today. We only have to look at something like the Britney Spears case, which has been all over the press this summer. Here is a woman who is fighting for autonomy, who is still kept in the legal shackles of male authority. She's a woman who, whenever she asserts herself, is punished psychiatrically. Look to, at the public stage, people like Vice President Kamala Harris or Nancy Pelosi. These women have been called mad. These women have said, been, you know, said about them, there's something wrong with her upstairs, simply because they stand up for what they believe in and they dare to put themselves out there and so I was really interested to write about these issues about the way that women are sort of tried to be boxed in by this accusation of insanity but I didn't want to write a polemic as I hope the opening chapter that I read you earlier demonstrates I am at heart a storyteller and that's what I wanted to do I wanted to tell a woman's story that would enable me to explore these issues, but to do so in a way that was intimate and personal and that mattered. Because I think often it's too easy to get sort of bogged down in statistics or, or things like that. They don't mean anything. But if you can walk in step with a woman to whom this has happened, then you feel all the more the injustice of it. You feel the anger, you feel the desire to get justice, and to make the world a better place. And so I went looking for the heroine of my next book. I fell down a rabbit warren of internet searches about women and madness. And on the 15th of January, 2018, I fell down that rabbit warren into a University of Wisconsin essay. Four pages in, there was a single reference in a single paragraph to Elizabeth Packard. I started digging into her story and very quickly I realised she was the one, the woman I wanted to write about next because what a woman she is. This is a truly extraordinary woman, a brilliant writer, a woman who defies not only the received medical wisdom of the age, but also the laws of the time as well. She goes out there fighting. She goes out with such spirit, with such belief in herself. And even though the whole world is telling her she is wrong, she is crazy, she needs to get back in her box, Elizabeth simply brushes off that criticism and she stands up and fights for what she believes in. She's a truly extraordinary woman. And also, what a story she has. 
This is a story that's packed full of courtroom drama with landmark legal trials. This is a story packed full of fascinating scientific facts, things that you cannot believe that doctors once thought were you know, accurate and true and somehow scientific. This is a book that stars this compelling heroine that has all the twists and turns of a dramatic story. This is a story too with twists of gothic horror as I take you inside the insane asylums of the 19th century. The drugs, the straitjackets, the realities of life behind those solid brick walls and behind those barred windows. And these were the things that really appeal to me about this story. Most of all, however, it was this fight against injustice, this injustice that still resonates today and how Elizabeth overcame it and how Elizabeth stood strong. But as I began my research for the book, I realized very quickly I was gonna be up against it because there is no Elizabeth Packard special collection where you can go and research, which seems astonishing to me given how much she contributed to the reform movements of the 19th century. Interestingly enough, while there is no memorial to Elizabeth Packard, Dr. Andrew McFarland, the superintendent of the Illinois State Hospital and the man who kept her incarcerated, he has a mental health center named after him in Springfield, Illinois. What I did find as I started researching, however, and what a gift, were Elizabeth's own books. That secret journal she had once kept in the asylum, she later published. She wrote memoirs, she told the world about her experiences. And it was such a gift to be able to draw on them from the book because she writes in first person about the intimate realities of being a sane woman dispatched to an insane asylum. She talks us through the emotion, the fear, the hope, the injustice. And it's incredibly insightful to read from her about what it was really like. I just want to uh, explain as well how those books came to be, because actually when Elizabeth tried to publish them, she was completely knocked back. No one would touch her with a barge pole, largely because she was deemed insane and they didn't want to publish the scribblings of a mad woman. But Elizabeth was determined that they would see light. And incredibly, she decided essentially in modern terms to crowdfund them. She went from door to door and begged people, well not begged even actually, just pitched herself, said, this is my story. I want the world to see it. And she persuaded thousands of people to give her just 50 cents. And with that capital, she was able to print her books and they became bestsellers. And so this is a woman who is truly extraordinary, just that tenacity, that desire to follow her mission through and to get it done, even if it takes, you know, no matter what it takes, she will do it. She was so forward thinking and so charismatic. Um, people actually said she was just full of this irresistible magnetism and the idea of her just going door to door, pitching herself and getting results is just quite extraordinary. Now, of course, I didn't just want to rely on Elizabeth's own words as emotional and as brilliantly written as they are. I also wanted to find out about my antagonists, the doctor, the husband, and I was lucky enough to be able to draw on that material too. I read Theophilus's diary, I've read McFarlane's letters and his medical writings. And in addition to these, I also delved into the records of the Illinois State Hospital itself. These I found incredibly insightful and shocking in a way because of the realities that they recorded. Perhaps one of the most shocking things I uncovered in those records was the fact that women were actually told to make their own restraining devices. They actually stitched their own straight jackets in the sewing room. That to me was just so astonishingly dark and yet it happened and it was true. I think nothing can touch for shock value and for horror, however, the truths that I uncovered in the medical journals of the age. These described the treatments that were being carried out on women in the 19th century for madness. 
Now, I mentioned earlier how simply possessing a female body left you at increased risk of going mad. Well, because doctors of the age thought that women's genitals were perhaps at fault in causing women to run mad, perhaps unsurprisingly, treatments focused on women's genitals too. They would be injected with iced water. They would have leeches applied or caustics. But by far the most shocking treatment I uncovered was something called a clitoridectomy, the surgical removal of the clitoris when a woman is deemed insane. But remember the world in which we're operating here. As I read the case notes of the women who had been subjected to this so-called treatment, I found a 20-year-old woman whose only so-called symptom of madness was that she liked to engage in serious reading. There was a 30-year-old wife included too, whose only evidence of madness which that she expressed dislike for the society of her husband, yet she too had gone under the knife or the scissors as one doctor preferred to use. Now you may think, well, that's awful, but it was a long time ago and they did things differently then. Well, that's true, but this was a treatment that persevered in the Western world. I found evidence that this operation to correct emotional disorder was carried out in the Western world right up until the 1940s. The last recorded case was on a five-year-old girl. The more I learned about this subject, the more passionate I became about it. And so my research for the book ultimately led me to America to follow in Elizabeth Packard's footsteps. I traveled to her hometowns and her birth towns in Massachusetts. I traveled to Shelburne, which is way up in the mountains in the north of the state, where Elizabeth spent most of her married life. It's a very insightful place to visit because, as I say, it's way up in the mountains on these forested hills. It's a place that speaks deafeningly of a landscape where things are as they always have been and always will be, you know, the heft of the mountains around you, the height of the trees that have been there for generations. And then to move as Elizabeth did to the open plains of the Midwest, it felt that she would have had that sense of leaving behind that landscape and emerging in a place where it was filled with endless possibilities, where she could see, you know, as far as the horizon and beyond. When I traveled to Illinois, I also went to worship one Sunday at the church where Elizabeth's husband had preached. That too was insightful as I stood and sat and sang and prayed with the congregation. And there was this sense of cohesive community and almost choreography in the rise and fall of bodies and voices. And to think of Elizabeth Packard breaking away from that, leaving her husband's church, that rejection of his authority so public, and yet she did it. She left that behind to strike out on her own. And I think it really underlined her assertiveness and the way that she would not be cowed. She had to do what was right for her and for her faith. And that summed Elizabeth up perfectly. As a coder, the church is now led by a female pastor. And I just thought that was brilliant because this church, once led by a man who would try to silence a woman, now has a woman speaking for them every single Sunday. And I just thought that was just such a brilliant coda to the story that I was researching. Perhaps the most powerful part of my research trip, however, was when I traveled to Jacksonville in Illinois, the site of the asylum where Elizabeth had been held. Like her, I walked past the stone gateposts that mark the borders of the asylum grounds. As you can imagine, they're incredibly old now, the stone is crumbling, yet they remain twice the height of a woman. And there is a very real sense of crossing over as you leave behind the roar of civilization and move into the peace of what is now a community park. To my disappointment, 
the hospital building in which Elizabeth had been held had been knocked down in the 1980s. I was 30 years too late to see it myself. But I did interview people who had been in it, teenagers who used to break in in the dead of night and traverse those long mental hospital corridors by flashlight, seeking out the secrets of the insane asylum. And those secrets are still there to be found. Years after the asylum had been knocked down, they found a tranche of unmarked graves in the grounds. The patients were always buried in unmarked graves and these patients had been forgotten. Though they knocked the building down, they kept the limestone windowsills because over the decades, the patients had etched messages into them, words and pictures trying to be heard. When I did another event like this in Jacksonville, someone who used to work in the hospital told me that actually it wasn't just the windowsills where they would try to make their marks. She remembered in the cells that there would be claw marks on the walls, patients trying desperately to be heard, to get out. Though the building had gone, there was still evidence of the world that Elizabeth Packard had operated in. The infant orchard, for example, that she had described in her books had now grown to maturity. And those trees were so many and so verdant that as the wind whistled through them, it sounded like a chorus of voices was there, speaking to me, trying to be heard. And though the main building had gone, there were still a few auxiliary buildings dotted around and it was haunting to peer through the windows of these abandoned hospital buildings to see the way that unfurling stalactites of paint unfurled from the bottom of the staircases looking like underwater seaweed or a drowning woman's hair. I glimpsed abandoned orphan furniture, a desk, a chair, a hat stand with no hats. These buildings were graffitied, don't open, dead inside. But I think it is important to open the doors to the past because through them step people like Elizabeth Packard with her spirit as wide as her cage crinoline skirt. Elizabeth left many legacies behind her, but I think perhaps her greatest legacy is this. Through her story, she teaches us all that we must become people who cannot be silenced. She teaches us all that actually you must have faith in yourself, no matter what insults may be hurled at you. Be true, be strong, stand up for yourself because she did it in the most incredible way. She really made a difference in the world. Women are made to fly and soar, she wrote not to creep and crawl as the haters of our sex want us to. And Elizabeth inspires us all to fly and to soar. I want to leave you with one final thought from Elizabeth herself. She said, I will not hide my light under a bushel. I will set it upon a candlestick that it may give light to others. And to this day, to all our benefit, Elizabeth Packard's light still shines and you can read all about it in The Woman They Could Not Silence. I hope her light will touch your lives just as it has done mine. Thank you. Bravo, that's quite a story. And as I said, it took me, I think 24 hours to read the book because I just couldn't put it down. So I highly recommend it to everyone who's been able to join us tonight. We have some questions. Um, first of all, someone asked uh, earlier today, how long did your research take? Um, uh, it was, so I first read Elizabeth's name uh, in January 2018, and I delivered my first draft in March 2020. Okay. So it was a, a two year process of getting yeah. to know her, of doing the trip, poring over the records. Um, and I'm the kind of writer, I do all my research first and I only sort of write in the last month or two, basically. So most of that time was research. So about two years of research, yeah. basically. 
Yeah, it sounds like there was so much research. Um, yeah. One person wrote in, were you able to find documentation explaining why patients were admitted? I'm very curious as to how detailed the applications were. Well, um, what's interesting about um, the history of mental health now is they have closed a lot of records. There was um, a law passed whereby even people who are now deceased, you cannot access their records. I think it's a privacy thing. You know, people may have wanted those psychiatric records sealed. And so a decision was made in the law courts that you can't open them. In Elizabeth's case, because it's been so well documented and because she herself wrote about it, included certain documents in her books, I've been able to access some of those um, files, um, but it's not like there's a whole tranche of material where researchers can go and look, thing, look things up. So I didn't find, for example, Theophilus's original application, but I did find the um, you know, admittance record book of the hospital which explained why McFarland had uh, admitted her and what, you know, why, what he thought the exciting cause of her insanity was. Okay, we have another person just wrote in. Uh, I am very curious what the husbands were up to after admitting their wives. That would be another interesting story. <laughs> True. Well, I mean, obviously a lot of the time it was, you know, it might've been because uh, the husband wanted to have an affair or the wife wanted a divorce and he didn't want, that scandal so if he just sent her away he could do what he liked and and be you know and she would be gone um so you're, you're quite right there was a lot of stories there as well um this was an earlier question also eventually she's reunited with her family uh did any of her children pursue the a political direction in the same way she has um, the, the son who was most inspired by her and most like her in his career was Samuel Packard which is very interesting because he's the son who is sort of the most difficult throughout the journey of the book. Um, but yes, he is inspired by Elizabeth. And in fact, when I was sort of looking up, you know, major figures in Chicago history, he had a chapter that oh. Elizabeth uh, did not. Um, so he became a lawyer and he was heavily involved, um, I think in the Dakotas um, becoming part of the United States. Um, sort of that move from uh, territory to statehood. He was involved somehow in um, uh, all of that business. And as I say, he worked as a lawyer as well. And he was inspired by Elizabeth to sort of, uh, you know, fight for what he believed in and, and, to, and to follow that course. Um, let's see. Um, well, someone asked, why did she not run away on the train ride to the asylum? But I guess that's the time. It's partly the time and also she, Elizabeth, very quickly actually sort of grasped, you know, this, this is the thing, you know, the, the opening line of the book is, um, if she screamed, she sealed her fate. Yeah. And Elizabeth knew if she picked up her skirt and ran, that would, could be cited as evidence of madness. You know, a, a, a mad woman running through the streets, you know, shouting out tales of kidnap, of horror, of my husband's trying to do this, you know actually on the journey she spoke very calmly to um a, a lot of people told them what was going on and they were sort of up in arms on her behalf but with the law as it stood they could do nothing to prevent it um and as i say she didn't want to sort of run howling down the streets she did talk very calmly to the people she met on the journey that this was what was happening and they were stunned and shocked because she was so sane and lucid um and theophilus was very angry with her for you know exposing what was going on um, but Elizabeth didn't want to run away, to break property, to do anything that could be seen as mad. And as I described in the presentation, unfortunately, there was this sort of medicalization of female behavior. So anything out of the ordinary could actually be cited as evidence of madness. So running away probably would have been, you know, even worse for her than had she not uh, tried at all. Uh, someone mentioned yesterday when I told them about this event, that there had been a movie with Angelina jo Jolie about the changeling. That's what I haven't seen it. Um, mm -hmm. Is it a similar storyline or? I think it's, they take, um, let's see. I think they replace her child with another child because something has happened to her child in the hospital. Okay. And she says that's not her child. And then of course she ends up in the asylum. And I have not seen it either. There you go. 
Well, as I say, this is partly why we're so interested to write about the subject, because it happens time and again, you know, whether it's Elizabeth being assertive or whether it's, you know, a, a woman falling pregnant with an illegitimate child, you know, society has chosen time and time again to send these difficult women uh, these difficult scenarios you know away to a mental hospital that's that's how society has often dealt with it yeah uh, when you talk about McFarlane you mentioned that he ha- really had no medical expertise at what point did mental health training come into play for for asylums or for the for the culture at large um, I don't know the exact year when it started to become a syllabus. I, I know, you know, my research revealed that there was no formal training at that time, but I don't know when there then became yeah. some. Presumably once that first generation felt confident enough, they then started teaching what they had learned to the next generation. So, yes, there was no, uh, he was medically trained, but he wasn't psychiatrically trained because such a thing did not exist at that time. Right. Um, let's see. What is the other? Uh, someone says, was she schooled at home? And if so, why did her father not help her? Um, she wasn't schooled at home. She went to Amherst, a uh, female seminary. Um, her father uh, was living in Massachusetts at the time this was happening. So this, um, she's in Illinois. So they're very far distant. She hasn't seen her dad for 10 years at this time because um, of the geographical distance and the hardness to get back. And actually, the ultimate answer is the father took the husband's side. You know, he hadn't seen Elizabeth to know that actually she was fine and she wasn't mad. Theophilus wrote to say, you know, she's suffering. She, she's gone mad. And the father chose to believe the son-in-law rather than the daughter. Wow. And I, I will add that he later changed his mind. Once Elizabeth was able to travel to see him, he was like, she's not mad at all and, and made public pronouncements on the matter that actually Theophilus had deceived him and uh, he w- was fully behind his daughter and evidence of that can be seen in the fact that when he died, he left her he, her share of his estate directly to her. It wasn't placed in trust. She didn't have to access it through her brothers. Um, it was given directly to her as a sign of her father's faith in her. Okay, we just had another question come in. In your research, did you find that most women lived their lives out at the asylums? How many get to leave? Um, I don't have any statistics on that. I think largely it depended, well, it depended on two things. One, if a woman would submit, then she was able to leave. Um, Two, if a husband didn't want the wife back, she would often be readmitted. So it, that was only a successful policy to a, to a certain uh, a certain degree. So I think those sorts of things were in play. Um, in Elizabeth's case, and generally, uh, hospitals could release what they thought of as incurable cases because mental health at that time was seen as something that you could cure. Um, that you know perhaps you'd go and have this sort of rest at the insane asylum, and then once you were made well, you would go back again. And so if you were deemed incurable, they would kick you out because the place at the hospital was deemed, you know, more deserving of someone who could be helped. So that was another way out as well. Um, Although often it it wasn't to freedom, it would lead to perhaps another incarceration in a different hospital, but it was another way out. Well, let's let's see. I think we might be at the end of our questions. There was one more. um, Someone had asked about the husband and his uh, his linkage to the gentleman that was trying to fund the movement for slavery or against slavery at the the adopted the, Theophilus. His name is yes. Theophilus. I can't remember. Yeah, Theophilus is the husband, and uh, they were asking about McCormick. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, so um, McCormick is, is um, uh, Cyrus H. McCormick is a super rich man, um, uh, one of America's richest men at the time. And yes, he was trying, he didn't want there to be a civil war, basically. And so he would use his wealth to try to place pro-slavery uh, preachers in place. So to sort of lead from the pulpit that, you know, you shouldn't follow this uh, abolition, you know, because he, he thought abolition would ultimately lead to the cessation of the states from the union and to civil war. And Theophilus's church 
was a beneficiary of money from Cyrus H. McCormick. Uh, and in doing that, the church switched its principles. So previously they were um, following new school theology, uh, which was uh, pro-abolition. And then they switched to old school, which was deliberately on the fence. So it wasn't necessarily pro-slavery, but it wouldn't preach from the pulpit that slavery was wrong. Uh, and Theophilus essentially took the money and Theophilus himself was actually uh, pro-abolition. But when this change in the creed came along and he took this money, he then had to change his public position at least. And so he no longer lectured um, or, or, or took a pro-abolition perspective at that time. Hmm. More to it than this meets the eye. There uh, is, yeah, I mean, and, and that's, I sort of write in the book, that's partly another reason why Elizabeth was sent away because Elizabeth was pro-abolition, uh, as I've described, was a woman who was not backward and coming forward. You know, she was very open about those views and, you know, she, to her, it was so obvious that, uh, you know, slavery was wrong. And so she would speak very publicly about that. And that was very embarrassing for Theophilus, you know, who, as I say, was now having to follow this, uh, not quite pro-slavery, but certainly, you know, anti-abolition yeah. uh, perspective. And so that was another reason to send her away so that she didn't upset the apple cart sort of yeah. politically as well. Yeah, all right. I think this is our last question. Was the asylum state funded or did the husbands have to pay for these services? So when Elizabeth was first sent away, uh, the state paid uh, for the patients. Um, and then by the time she leaves, the state is only covering patients who can't afford it. Now, at that point, the has lost his job. So the state is still covering Elizabeth's care because he can't afford it because he's lost his job. All right. Well, I think we've come to the end of our hour, and I can't thank you enough for staying up so late in London and sharing such a dramatic story with us. It's just totally um, amazing that it's, it's on that we don't know about it. <laughs> well, as I say, she's she's the woman they could not silence, but they've tried yeah. very hard to silence her. So yeah. it, it's been a privilege to try to help have a voice, and I thank you for the opportunity to help her you know share that story and I hope if people read the book they'll enjoy it and be inspired by what an iconic woman Elizabeth Packard was oh, for sure. so thank you for the opportunity to talk about her absolutely thank you for joining us and have a good sleep thank you okay. <laughs> thank you good so night, much everyone. we'll see you nice soon to see you all thank you thank you